Hello everyone. On this video we will be looking at how to use unit vectors in angle applications. Alright, so to get started, first thing we're going to do is review how our unit vector actually looks. So we have our X and we have our Y. So across the X axis, this is our I unit vector, which is equal to one zero. And vertically, that's our J unit vector, which is equal to zero one. So, of course, I vector and J vector are both unit vectors. Okay, so what if the vector is not going along the x axis or along the y axis? What if, and we draw our x, y axis again? We have our x and we have our y. What if our unit vector goes in a different direction? Not left to right, not up and down, just another direction where this is our unit vector. Okay, well, first thing we do is we want to know exactly. How many degrees up our vector is going? Okay. Then we'd want to know our x value and our y value. Okay, but if you remember from parametric equations, you know that x is equal to r cosine of theta. Okay, so since our unit vector can literally go in any direction. Assume that's like a perfect circle, even though my drawing is horrible. We know that the length of that radius is 1, since it's a, a, a unit circle. So since we know that r is equal to 1, we see that x is equal to 1 times cosine theta, or just cosine theta. Same thing with y. y equals r sine of theta. Again, r is equal to 1. So that means that y is equal to sine of theta. Okay, so how does that help us out? We know that u is equal to the vector with one component and two components. That means u vector can be equal to the components right at the terminal point. Okay, so normally this would be x comma y, but instead it's going to be cosine sine. So we have our first component is cosine of theta, and our second component is sine of theta. But we can also write that as a linear combination. So that's equal to cosine theta times the i vector plus sine theta times the j vector. Which is just another way to write our unit circle. All right, so if you are still writing, feel free to press pause, but we're going to go ahead and get started on our next page. Okay, now the fun thing about this is this 
this can actually be applied to non-unit vectors also. So once again, we're going to draw our x, y axis. Our x, and we have our y. And once again, we're going to have a vector kind of going out into some direction. And again, that can be any direction at all. It doesn't have to just be that direction. Okay. So instead of a unit vector, let's say this is some vector b. Okay, and again, this is our cosine theta, and vertically is our y or our sine theta. Okay, now looking at this, we're going to start just like we did before. We know that x is equal to r cosine theta. Okay, now in this case, we know that the radius isn't 1. What's the distance of the radius? Well, it's actually just the magnitude of your B vector. Remember, magnitude just tells the length of the vector. So x will actually equal the magnitude of the B vector times cosine of theta. Of course, y equals r sine of theta, which means that y will equal the magnitude of the b vector times sine of theta. Okay, so that means the b vector, just like before, will equal the first component and the second component. Okay, but in this case, instead of x comma y, it will be the magnitude of the b vector times cosine of theta. And the magnitude of the b vector times sine of theta. All right, so what does that give us? Our b vector is equal to our first component, which is the magnitude times cosine of theta. And the y component, the second component, is the magnitude of the b vector times sine of theta. Now, if we wanted to write that as a linear combination, that's just the magnitude of b times cosine theta times i vector plus the magnitude of b times sine theta times the j vector. Okay, so you use that for non-unit vectors. Okay. You can use it for unit vectors also because the magnitude will still be one, but this is kind of a general form that you can use for non-unit vectors if you want to. Okay. Now, the good thing about this is we know that a vector can be used to represent anything with magnitude and direction. It can be used to represent force. It can be used to represent velocity. It can be used to represent a ton of other things in physics and engineering. Okay, so a vector can be used to represent force and other applications. Since it has both, oh, let me move that up, sorry about that, magnitude and direction. All right, 
So if you are still writing, feel free to press pause. But we're going to go ahead and do a quick example. Okay, so let's say, for example, three forces with magnitudes of 75 pounds, 100 pounds, and 125 pounds. act on an object at angles of 30 degrees, 45 degrees, and 120 degrees with the positive x-axis. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to find the direction and magnitude of the resultant force. Right. So to kind of give you a visual of what we're looking for, so let's say you have an object. Okay, let's say we have a little hook right here at the top. Okay, so for that hook, Okay, this is your x-axis. We're pulling on that hook at 30 degrees. And that's 75 pounds. Pulling that 45 degrees. And that's at 100 pounds. And we're pulling at 120, well, yeah, 120 degrees, which would be about right here. And that's at 125 pounds. Okay, so we're pulling on that object in three different directions at three different magnitudes. And we want to figure out if we did that, exactly what would be the magnitude of the, whole, the force of the whole thing and which direction would it actually go. It won't go completely this way or completely this way or completely this way as long as you have the other two forces working on it. Okay, so how do we find the magnitude and direction of the resulting force? Okay, we know that we can find the force on that object by adding all of the forces being applied to it together. Okay, so force number one, force number two, and force number three will be the resultant force. Okay, so that means that our force will be equal if we use this as our first force. That would be 75. Remember, that's the magnitude. So we have the magnitude times cosine of theta. So 75 times cosine of 30 times the i vector plus 75 times sine of 30 degrees times the j vector. Okay, and that's our first force. Okay, so that would be plus 
we have 100 pounds acting on 45 degrees. So we have magnitude of 100 times cosine of 45 degrees times the I vector plus 100 pounds times sine of 45 degrees times the J vector. Remember that's our second force. Okay, so it's plus, so we have 125 pounds of magnitude at 120 degrees. So you have 125 times cosine of 120 degrees times the I vector plus 125 times sine of 120 degrees times the J vector. Okay, and this is our third force. All right, so what we are going to do is we're going to go ahead and add all of our I vector terms together. Okay, so that means force is actually going to equal, adding all these together, you know, cosine of 30 degrees, 45 degrees, and 120 degrees. We have 75 times square root of 3 over 2, which is 75 over 2 times square root of 3, plus we have square root of 2 over 2 times 100, which is 50 square root of 2, minus we have 125 times cosine of 120, so it's minus 125 over 2, and that's all of those times the I vector, plus here we have 75 times sine of 30 degrees, so that's 75 over 2 plus we have sine of 45 degrees times 100 which is 50 square root of 2 plus we have 125 times sine of 120 degrees which is 125 times 2 square root of 3 and all of that times the j vector okay so we added all those together and all those together and this is what we ended up with Okay, so this, not our answer, but this is what's going to lead us to our answer. So this is our force here. Okay, now if you remember, your vector is equal to, let's say, V1 times I vector. Let me move that over, make that a little bit bigger. Instead of trying to squeeze it in that little bitty spot. Okay, and I, actually, I'll just put it right here. Okay, if you remember, our vector is equal to our first component times the I vector plus the second component times the J vector. Okay, now in this case, this is our first component. We'll call that this whole thing our first component. And this whole thing is our second component, so we'll call this our F2. Okay. So now, using this same idea here, we have to find the magnitude of, of the resultant force. Move that up some. There we go. Okay. So to find our magnitude of the resultant force, remember the magnitude is just the square root of the first component squared plus the second component squared. Okay. I have to admit, plugging all this into a calculator is a bit of a pain, but if you do it correctly, the first component squared, so if you calculate all of this and square it, you'll actually end up with 53.52.76. Plus, if you calculate all this and square it, you will end up with 46,856.6, which calculates to about 228.494. 
which you can calculate to be about 228.5 pounds. Okay, so this is the magnitude of the resultant force. All right, so now we're not done yet. We're a, we have a good chunk of it behind us, but we're not completely done yet because we still have to find the direction. Okay, now to find the direction, you have to kind of think back a little bit to your parametric equation. If you remember, theta is equal to tangent inverse of y over x. All right. So the theta of the resultant force, we'll put theta of r, that's equal to tangent inverse. And remember, this is your y and this is your x. Okay. So the tangent inverse of your f of 2, remember all that is your f of 2, and I don't really want to write all that. Uh-oh, didn't mean to put that equal sign there. Tangent inverse of your f of 2 all over the tangent inverse of your f of 1. Okay. So again, once you plug all that in, we will see that your tangent of your reason, the angle of your resulting force will come up to be about 71.3253, which will become rounded to about 71.3 degrees. Okay, so this is your direction. Okay, so if we kind of scroll back up to our object just a little bit here, we'll see that if we all these forces are applied, it will be pulled to about, I'll say 71.3 degrees is about right here. It could be off a little bit, but that's the direction it would go. Okay, now a little bit of advice. I actually had to do this one about three times because I kept getting the wrong answer. Then I had to figure out that, okay, I'm getting it. The wrong answer because I did not set my calculator to degrees. Okay, now I should know better, but I still made that mistake. So be sure your calculator is set to degrees. Because I hate for you to do all that work and do like I do and do the same thing over and over and over, get the same answer, just to find out you had your calculator set wrong. So remember to set your calculator to degrees okay so that is my helpful hint for the day all right so hopefully this video made sense and i will see you on the next video